All right, good morning. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. I'm Carrie. I am the former associate pastor here and as the first church planner to get sent out by City View. Uh, we went to Alvin and we did that for a good four years. And then we ran out of all sorts of gas, steam, energy, emotional stability. And we had to close it down back in September. So I get the unique title of being the first church planner sent out and the first one to close it all down. And it's an honor to have that title for you, Jason. So, but I was excited to come back. It's been a weird three months of dealing with just the emotional weight and heaviness of having to close down your biggest pet project you've ever had in your entire life and to also tell some of your very closest friends you've ever had in your entire life that they probably need a different pastor because I'm spent and I need help. So what I want to teach on today is a passage that has become a great source of comfort and hope and stability for me, and I want to see if maybe you can relate a little bit to it, and maybe you can find the value in it as well. And what we're going to be looking at is the restoration of Peter. Today we've entitled it How Peter Got His Groove Back. If you're not familiar with New Testament teaching and about the guy Peter... He is unique in that he's one of the most bold people in history. And what we mean by bold is just a nice way of saying that dude just said whatever he thought at the moment and never thought maybe I should keep it to myself, which I can relate to in a bunch of ways. And so if you're not familiar with Peter, he has the distinction of being one of the first disciples, the oldest disciple. He is the first guy to get a nickname from Jesus himself, and then he's also the guy to also be called Satan by Jesus himself. So he's very much a roller coaster, and that's where we're going to be looking. And today we're looking at this extremely awkward conversation Jesus has with Peter in front of the disciples after he had his biggest monumental screw-up in his entire life and ministry. And I don't know if you've ever been a part of witnessing an awkward conf confrontation. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen someone get dressed down in front of others and ex experience the embarrassment of watching someone else get embarrassed. But that's kind of what we're looking at today. And it reminds me of a few awkward stories that I have that I'd like to share with you. I was talking to my dad the other day. And we drove by an apartment complex by my house. And he goes, that reminds me of the first apartment that your mom and I had together. He goes, that reminds me of a funny story. There was one time I was coming home from work. And I came out going to my door. And there's a bunch of yelling by the pool. And all I hear is my friend Don yell, no, not the guitar. And then I just see a guitar fly over my head into the pool. And dad turns around and says, hey, Don, how's it going? And then his wife, Maria, goes, hey, John, Don can't talk right now. He's in a bunch of trouble. And toss the stereo out over Dad's head. He goes, well, Don, I'll talk to you later. Have a good one. And just left because it's awkward, super, super awkward. Reminds me of the time when people who I thought were my closest friends allowed me to be attacked by another pastor with a super awkward man massage. And they did literally nothing to stop this handsy maniac from rubbing my shoulders for like three straight minutes. And I didn't even get to see the guy's face, didn't even get to shake his hand. And he has a different version of the story because he knows he's in the wrong and he still won't confess or repent. So pray for your pastor. Reminds me of the time when once I went bowling with a bunch of friends in college, and we went on one of the busiest nights before Thanksgiving, and there were two lanes wide open, and we get in line just kind of begging we can get those last two lanes, and as I'm watching all these people bowl, there's one guy in particular who sticks out because he's a gigantic offensive lineman of a man with the old 
Rocky IV Dolph Lundgren haircut. And he had the glove and was just drilling it. And he was wearing a Randy Moss jersey. That's why I thought he was an offensive lineman. And crushing pins. And was like yelling and high-fiving. It was like, whoa, that guy's serious. So I get up there and say, hey, can we get those last two lanes? And he goes, sorry, it's women's league night. And I go, what? How do you figure it's women's league night? How come Randy Moss over here gets to bowl? And he goes, who are you talking about? I was like, the gigantic Dolph Lundgren looking guy who looks like he's put on a couple hundred pounds. And he goes, that's my wife. I blacked out. I don't know what happens. <laughs> but I bet I got chewed out really, really bad with lots of cuss words. I just don't remember. And thankful my friend Lucas was there to drag me out of that bowling alley before Randy Moss came after me. There's something about watching someone just get completely annihilated verbally that's just breathtaking. It's like watching a car wreck. And what makes it breathtaking is you and I just empathize. We go, oh, we don't ever want to be in that position. And we kind of want to support them. And we kind of also want to be as far away from here as humanly possible. But we feel bad whether we stay or go. We just feel awful. So today what I'm going to read is the story where Jesus gets on to Peter for his biggest screw-up. And if you're not familiar with his biggest screw-up, there was a time when Jesus needed Peter the most in his life, and Peter acted like he didn't know Jesus in public. In public, Jesus, Peter just said, I don't even know the man, and just totally bowed out and wimped out on Jesus and left Jesus literally to die, which was a part of the plan that we're going to see. But it still is a huge screw-up if you're going to be the big leader to take Jesus' place when he leaves the planet. So that's what we're going to read. We're going to read John chapter 21, verses 2 through 19. And we're going to read how Jesus confronts Peter's biggest screw-up. One of the things I want you to notice is Peter is not his original name. That's his nickname that Jesus gave him. Peter means rock. Before Jesus gave him the name, he went by Simon. Simon means pebble, just so you know. That's, that's where the joke comes from. Simon was a pebble before Jesus, became a rock with Jesus. So, cool nickname. There are a bunch of nicknamey guys there, as we're going to see. And this is what he says about Simon Peter, and then another guy, Thomas, who has a nickname called Twin. No one ever explains the nickname of Thomas. So, Good luck figuring that one out. It says in verse 2, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, Zebedee's sons, which is John and James, and two others of his disciples were together. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter said to them. We're coming with you, they told him, and they went out and got in a boat, but that night they caught nothing. And when daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore now, I want you to understand, Jesus has died, he's come back, he's met with the disciples twice, and both times he's disappeared. And so the disciples are just kind of, we don't know what we do with our lives now. We don't know if we've screwed everything up, especially Peter here. We don't know what the new job is. Jesus hasn't just sat down and spent time and said, okay, here's the plan. He's just revealed himself a couple times, very mysteriously. So we're about, this is the third time Jesus shows up to them. So Jesus comes on the shore. However, the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Verse 5, men, Jesus called to them. Do you have any fish? You don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. Cast the net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did, and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. Let's pause there. If you're familiar with Peter's story in the New Testament story of Jesus, this is the first miracle Peter ever experienced was this exact same event. Throwing the nets on the other side, huge haul. Peter bows down and worships Jesus and actually tells Jesus, don't take me as a disciple because I'm a terrible human being. And Jesus said, that'll work. I'll make you a fisher of men. So he's doing the exact same thing when he first met Jesus for the very first time. So 
you're just going to see there's a whole bunch of homages and importance. It's like the episode nine of Peter's life. We're coming all full circle. If you hated episode nine, I feel for you. But I also make fun of you behind your back. Okay. So, verse 7, Therefore the disciple, the one Jesus loved, said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he tied his outer garment around him, for he was stripped and plunged into the sea. But since they were not far from the land, about a hundred yards away, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. That part just cracks me up in that Peter was like, good luck, guys, I'm gone. And all the guys were like, guys, it's just like a hundred yard walk. I feel like you could help us here, Peter, and we could get this done faster, and we could all get to Jesus, the Lord of the universe. But he's like, nope, see ya. Which is like another story in the Bible, when Jesus walked on water. The very first person to go out on the water with Jesus, Peter. Very first person to sink on Jesus' dime and watch, Peter. So this is, again, you're seeing just a lot of, this all a bunch of callbacks to the very first time. Verse 9, when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread Verse 10, bring some of the fish that you've just caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter got up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of the disciples dared ask, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Verse 15, and this is where it gets super confrontational, super awkward. So get ready. You're going to feel embarrassed as you watch Peter get dressed down. If you remember, Peter denies Jesus three times. And so Jesus now has to get Peter back on track three times. So here we go. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to them. You know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. He asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved that he asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. I assure you, when you were young, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you do not want to go. He said this to signify what kind of death he would glorify God. After saying this, he told him, follow me. All right, so a lot of buildup, a lot of story here. Let's break it down. I've got... Three big points for you today and a big conclusion. And you can follow along on your, your card that you got. The first point that I want to talk about today is the crushing effects of failing. I don't know if you noticed in verse 3, and this is the part that I noticed as I read this after going through what I went through, closing down my church. In verse 3, Peter goes back to his old day job. He quits trying to start the very first church. He quits being a disciple of Jesus. He goes back to fishing, what he was before Jesus felt, found him. That's why it's interesting when you see Jesus talk to Peter, he doesn't call him Peter three different times. He calls him his old name, he calls him Simon three different times, which hadn't really happened since he got the new nickname. It's very interesting where we're finding Peter here. We're finding Peter has quit. He doesn't want to do this anymore. Now, I don't know if you can relate to that. I did when I read this. I went back to my old job. I went back to school teaching. That's what I was before any of this crazy ministry stuff came into my life for 11 years. And I don't know where you're at. Maybe you've had a huge monumental letdown in life, a huge screw-up in life. Maybe you've botched it real hard like Peter has in some way, and you've decided, I'm done going forward with some of this spirituality stuff that God's been pouring into me. I'm putting it all on pause, 
and we're not going to go deeper anymore because the deeper we go, seems like there's a bunch of pain and suffering. So we're just going to stop at a level that keeps our hearts safe from feeling heartache. And I would say that's crushing. I don't know if you've had recently or just in a very poignant way your heart smashed in a billion pieces lately, but that's the effect it has on you. It causes you to literally, emotionally, spiritually stop. Put the brakes on everything, and for a lot of us, we put up a safety mechanism where we just say, we're never letting our heart get that touched, that deep, that close ever again. And so we're just going to put walls up to prevent that from ever happening. That's where we find Peter. He's gone back to fishing because he doesn't know what to do. He knows he screwed up with Jesus. He's pretty sure Jesus isn't talking to him because of the big screw up. So therefore, he's done. He had a shot. He blew it. What's interesting is in Luke chapter 22, Jesus predicted this screw up. If you're familiar with the story, you know Peter, on the night Jesus was betrayed, Peter was on safety patrol for Jesus. No one gave him this job. He just took it upon himself. Throughout the Gospels, we see James and Peter and John always arguing about who gets to be the number two in charge, who gets to be the vice king of the universe, who gets to be the one that Jesus sits next to and makes all the decisions with, who gets to be not the Messiah, but like the guy who's right next to the Messiah. And Jesus, Jesus even warns them, guys, you don't even want to be at my right hand or my left hand because the way we get to the kingdom is through three crosses. And he's like, you don't want that job. So on the night he's betrayed, Jesus does like he had been doing. Guys, I'm about to be betrayed by one of y'all. I'm about to suffer all sorts of pain. I'm going to die, but don't worry, three days I'm coming back. And Peter, without really skipping a beat, goes, this will never happen. I will, they might fail you big time and run away, but I will fight to the death for you. And in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 34, this is what Jesus says to him. He says, Simon, Simon, look out. Calls him the old name again. He says, look out. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. The Lord told him, I am ready. Lord, he told him, I am ready to to go with you both to prison and to death. And then Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you deny me three times that you even know me. But did you see there, Jesus said, hey, I know you're about to get sifted by Satan himself. You're not gonna win that battle. I'm praying for your faith so that when you turn back, you'll take care of all the disciples. I'm praying for your faith for when you come back. And we turn this whole ship around and you stick to the plan that we've always had together, which is you be the rock and you having access to the rock that God will build his old church on. Peter thought that he alone could protect Jesus and that he alone could actually save Jesus. So he built up in his mind this random reputation that he's going to be the thing that keeps the Messiah in place, not realizing there is no need for that job. So when Jesus tells him, you're going to deny me three times, he's basically saying, whatever title, whatever status you had in your head, it does not exist, and there's coming a time you're going to publicly use that fake title, and you're going to lose it bad. But when you turn back, you're going to get your real title, and we're going to get down to real jobs I have for you. I think that's the big sin. Denying Jesus is a symptom of the big sin. The big sin Peter was harboring this entire time was a massive amount of pride. He thought he was Jesus' gift to Jesus. And all this pride grew and grew and he made a fake title in his own head and he gave himself importance that he never needed. The job that Jesus had for him and the title Jesus had for him was more than enough to be important. But for whatever reason, Peter thought he needed more than that and needed to be more than that and needed a certain status. 
And Jesus comes in and says, Satan's going to take that status away from you, and it's probably for the best. See, I don't know, what if some of our biggest screw-ups in life aren't meant to take us to a worse place in life, but to a greater effectiveness in Jesus' hands? Let me say that again. What if our biggest screw-ups, what if our biggest failures, what if our biggest heartbreaks aren't there to ruin our lives in some way, but what if they're there by God's plan to make us more effective for God's plan? What if all the bad that hits us so hard is for ultimate good? Brings me to my next point, the humiliating effects of confrontation. I think this is interesting. I don't get into a lot of Greek word study stuff. I intentionally avoided seminary my entire life to avoid learning Greek and Hebrew because we've got apps for that. So on my app, look what I found out. In John, where we read about Peter, Jesus makes this charcoal fire. And I was like, that's weird that it just says charcoal fire. I didn't know they had charcoal back then. So I clicked my app and found out, yes, that is a word back then. They had charcoal 2,000 years ago. There's only two places in the New Testament, it turns out, that that word shows up. It's also strangely where we get the word anthrax from. Did you know that? Of course you didn't know that. I didn't know that. But if you had the app, you did. Yeah. So all sorts of new stuff we're learning this week. I just want you to know. The other place where charcoal fire shows up is in John chapter 18, verses 15 through 18. This is what it says. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was following Jesus as he's being arrested. And and along with another disciple, that disciple was an acquaintance of the high priest. So he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter remained standing outside by the door. So the other disciple, the one who is known by the high priest, went out and spoke to a girl who was the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Then the slave girl who was the doorkeeper said to Peter, you aren't one of the man's disciples too, are you? I am not, he said. Now the slaves and the temple police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. And they were standing there warming themselves and Peter was standing with them warming himself. So the scene of the crime was around a charcoal fire. Peter's restoration would also be around a charcoal fire. I just find that interesting. Couldn't tell you what it means, but I think Jesus really wants to confront the snot out of this mistake. He doesn't want to tiptoe around it. He doesn't want to pretend like it wasn't a big deal. He doesn't want to make it smaller to ease Peter's feelings into the situation. Jesus very gently, calmly, lovingly says, no, let's deal with this. Let's not pretend it didn't happen. Let's not ever talk about this again. Jesus is saying, let's talk about this a lot. In fact, let's put it in a bunch of the Gospels so we have to deal with it all the time. Which again, Peter was like, I don't think that's a great whatever. And so he's back in the humiliation point when Jesus starts asking the big question, do you still love me? I just can't imagine the situation there. And all the disciples are around watching this going, oh, snap. Jesus asked Peter, the guy who brags about loving Jesus way too much, if he actually loves him because we all saw him totally botch it with the high priest. Peter was the first one to run away when Jesus wanted them to be there. Peter was the first one to fall asleep when Jesus wanted him to pray. Jesus, Peter was just bold in every direction. And so here we go again. Time to get bold again, Peter. Let's see if you can pass it this time. So you can see he's humiliated in front of everyone. And again, you and I can look at Jesus and go, gosh, this is harsh, maybe too harsh. Maybe we shouldn't go down this road again. Maybe we should avoid it like the plague and never deal with stuff. But I want to remind you, Jesus had just gotten, got done being the most humiliated man on earth. When he was taken, arrested for crimes he didn't commit, 
stripped naked, shoved onto a piece of wood, nailed there, shoved thorns into his scalp, and made fun of in public for all to see. And I want us to see something. It turns out, especially with Jesus, humiliation is the pathway to which we find salvation. The way we get saved is through humiliation. The way you and I receive Jesus' grace is by humiliating ourselves and saying, Jesus, we need a new Savior. We need a Lord. I cannot do it. And that's how we are saved, by putting our complete faith in him and zero faith in ourselves. And so I want you to see humiliation, you and I, we need to get to a place where public humiliation, it's probably not a bad thing after all. It's probably everything we need, especially when our pride is getting way out of hand, especially when we do things like I did in leading my church and thinking, I don't need to get help for my emotional problems. My people need me to help them. So therefore, I'm too good to get what I'm telling them to get. That was my big pride fall when I had to close down my church. So I want to encourage you, get to a place where you're okay saying, I've got a big pride problem. I should get help from one another. That's why I like that the disciples are there. They see this shakedown of Peter and they go, wow, glad we're not him. But they're also like, wow, glad we see Jesus make Peter right again. He hasn't been the same since his huge screw up. It's nice to see Jesus get him back on track. We couldn't do it. That's what I think we as a church we need to get to is where humiliation isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's where we receive our grace. It's by humbling ourselves. By saying we aren't as important as we wanted to be. Jesus needs to be more important. And I'm having a hard time doing that. So I go to my brothers and sisters and say, help me get to where I need to be humiliated back down to. I think that would be a great place to go, which goes to my third point. The motivating effects of persistence. Let's talk about how Jesus gets Peter back on track. In verses 15 through 17, he does the three-question thing. We all know why he picked three. Because Peter denied him three times. Now here's what's really interesting. He persistently pushes Peter into facing his sin. But not with insults, not with argument, not with yelling and shouting at each other and accusing each other, but with gentle persistence and not letting Peter go, says, we're going to confront this. We're going to make you right. Again, I think we want Jesus to treat us like we like to treat each other, and that's just saying, you know what, you did screw up back there, just say you're sorry, and we'll never bring this up again. Whereas Jesus would say, not only are you going to tell me you're sorry, but we're going to bring this up often and we're going to use this as a teaching moment and this is going to be one of the best ways I use you in the world. The thing that has gotten me through the last three months is going, you know, I'm not the first pastor to kind of screw up stuff. And Lord knows, I never denied Jesus three times. So really, I'm better than the first guy who did this job in a lot of ways. I didn't like ever speak in tongues and lead thousands of people to Jesus like at the same moment but I'd like to think if I was there maybe I could have done it who knows but what we see here is Jesus just pushes Peter to go there to not be afraid I think the thing the big pride that we hate is we like the statuses in our minds that we've made of ourselves we like the reputation that we build of ourselves we like to get people to think what we want them to think about ourselves And then we're terrified if someone should come in and disrupt that. Yet you and I know Jesus is in the business of doing exactly that. And so my question to you and I is, are we resisting Jesus way too much on what he wants to call us? And I think what Jesus would like to call us is what he calls everybody, little children. His little children. I think you and I can puff ourselves up so much that we can even kind of convince ourselves we don't need Jesus for everything. The truth is, right now, we need Jesus to get our lungs to work at the right time, to breathe in, breathe out, to get our heart to beat at the right time, to get the blood, to take the oxygen to the muscles. 
we need Jesus for everything. I think sometimes we can tend to think, no, I need my paycheck for everything, so I will work hard for my paycheck, and I will be my family's provider. It's not true. You don't get that title. There's only one provider for us. There's only been one provider for us. So I think you and I use a lot of fear to convince ourselves, don't go there and see how things really are, and that is you and I are incredibly weak, and we're incredibly borrowing a ton of time, and we're incredibly needy, and we're incredibly useless without Jesus. But that's a good place to know and be. Because if you can get there and know and be that, turns out Jesus really likes to use people who know that. What if the only thing that's stopping you and I from doing what Jesus called us to do is just us? What if the only thing that's stopping us from doing what Jesus called to do is us and our fears? The only one who has changed in the scenario of what God's calling us to do and what's causing us to not happen is us saying, you know what, I'm too afraid to go out on those limbs with Jesus. We're the only ones stopping us when you think about it. So that brings me to my conclusion. The freeing effects of honesty. Let's go back to that cool app that translates words for me. In this story, Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? But you and I, if you're familiar with a tiny bit of Greek, we have one word for love, Greek has four. The word Jesus is using in that question is agape love. Do you agape love me? Agape is the only kind of love that God has, unconditional love. He's the only one that can do it. Zero conditions, zero things to affect God's love. Do you agape love me, Peter? You know how Peter responds three times? I phileo love you. That's what he says. He changes the word. Peter does not say, I agape love you. He says, I phileo love you. Phileo is brotherly love. That's where we get the city of brotherly love from, Philadelphia. Same kind of word. So isn't that interesting? Peter cannot say to Jesus, I love you with the extreme most amount of love there is in the universe. And Peter used to be able to say that. Why is that? It's because now Peter's being honest with himself. He now knows Nope, can't do it. I thought I could do it, and I realized, no, that's impossible. I cannot do it. And I was wrong. So this is Peter admitting to Jesus, I was wrong the last time I told you. I would go to prison for you. I would die for you. I was wrong. And we know in the book of Acts, Peter does go to prison. Peter does die for him. Like, he, he comes through after this. He screws up a bunch of other ways, but he comes through on that one. But in this moment, Peter is finally being honest with himself. He's not the number one lover of Jesus on the planet. He's not. He's finally admitting, I don't deserve to be the second in charge. I don't deserve to be anything with a title that brings me anywhere near your greatness. I don't deserve it. And that's all Jesus wanted him to know. See, Peter is right. You don't deserve any of this. You are not my gift to me. You're just one of my many children who needs a ton of grace. So my encouragement and question to you is, what if the reason you and I are not truly taking on what God has called us to do is because we've had false thoughts about ourselves where we either think way too much about our importance or we think way too little about our importance. But what if the reason you and I aren't going in the direction Jesus wants is because we're thinking the wrong things like Peter did? What do you think Jesus has been wanting to gently and honestly confront in you to say, we need these thoughts gone about yourself? One of the things I had to learn early on when I became a minister was I had more faith in my ability to screw everything up than I did in Jesus' ability to use a screw-up. So those first couple of years of youth ministry, I was struggling hard. And you know what I didn't do was like, again, get help, talk to people, ask for help. I didn't do that. You know why? Because I was a minister. 
Ministers don't ask for help, we help people. That's where the bad idea came from 11 years ago. What if you and I have way more faith in our ability to fail Jesus than we do faith in Jesus' ability to use a failure? And what if that's causing us to keep the kingdom of God from really expanding around us? Is we believe way more in our ability to not do a good job than God's ability to do a great job? What if that's the thing that's holding us back? What do you think Jesus has always wanted you to get back up and going for, but you quit on a long time ago because you messed up? And who else in this room needs to watch you struggle with this and needs to see how God gives you the grace to get through this? What if you and I got freakishly, humiliatingly honest with one another and said, this is where I'm stuck and I need a bunch of grace for my Christian brothers and sisters to get unstuck again. What if we loved each other like Jesus loved us and we said, I'll watch you be embarrassed and I'll be there with you and I will cheer you on hard as I see Jesus do right things in you again. What if we did that? What would happen? What would change? What seats in here would get filled if we got ridiculously honest with Jesus, ourselves, and each other on what we really, really need to get moving again for the kingdom? 